Good morning. So I was a little torn this morning because someone told me you can't say Happy New Year's after the fourth of the year, but this is our first worship service of the new year. And so I'm going to break the rules and say Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right, now we're ready to take on the new year and all of its challenges. But as we come and we think about worshiping together, let our prayer be the one that was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. From Habakkuk 3, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with all by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. I invite you as we gather in the house of the Lord to take a moment and rise and greet one another into worship this day. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Thank you. 
Father, we thank you for now being at this dawning of this new year. We thank you for your work in our lives. And as we sing together of your goodness, of your works, of what you have done and what you can and continue to do, let us approach our worship, our lives living out for you in this way, that we trust not in our plans, on our abilities, our strength, but instead, Lord, that we trust in you. May our worship be a matter of trust. And worship and praising for who you are and what you have done and what you continue to do in our lives. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. You may be seated.
have just a couple announcements this morning. Uh, first is, if you look in your bulletin, uh, there's an announcement about the summer mission trip. If you are interested or you even think there's a chance you might be interested in the summer mission trip to Mexico, there is a meeting in the youth room after service. And so if you go to the ARC Center, the gym, and you go upstairs, that's where the meeting will be to talk about those plans and that potential um, of going and being a part of that trip. And that's open, not just for the youth and their parents, but any, any adults that want to come along and, and be a part of that adventure are, are more than welcome. And so if you're interested, please take the time to learn more about that mission and serving opportunity. You might also be wondering this morning why there's a shredder in front of church. That's not a permanent fixture, but we'll find out later. And so that's my teaser for later in the service. But this morning, we do have a great honor and privilege. We, uh, we get to install our elected elders and deacons uh, throughout the course of, of service and ministry. Churches have different people that are called up for a season to serve, and we're very grateful for all those who have served their terms in the past that have been willing to accept that calling into that office. And, and this time, I'd like to invite four of those four that were um, nominated for this term to join us up front here as we install them as newly elected and installed, therefore, elders and deacons. Beloved in the Lord, you have an important calling that you have been recognized by God in this congregation to. And so we ask you to walk in a worthy manner of this calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and patience and to bear one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We know that there is one body and one spirit. And just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all. But grace was given to each one of us to measure of Christ's gift. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we obtain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure and the statue of the fullness of Christ. This congregation, through a process of discernment, has elected the following people to the offices of elder and deacon. As elder, we have Don Brands and J.R. Lunenberg. For deacon, we have Jason Heatbrink and Eric Lindner. We believe that this true church ought to be governed according to the spiritual order that our Lord has taught us in his word. That there should be ministers or pastors to preach the word of God and to minister the sacraments. That there should also be elders and deacons along with the pastor to make up the council of the church. By this means, faith is preserved. True doctrine is able to take its course. And those who fall away from the path God has set forth can be held in the good grace and direction of the church. So that also the poor and all afflicted may be helped and comforted according to their need. By this means, everything will be done well and in good order in the church when such persons are elected who are faithful and are chosen according to the rule that Paul gave to Timothy. So as you stand before us now, I ask you these questions. Please answer faithfully. Do you believe in your heart that you are called by Christ's church and therefore God to this office? Do you believe in the Old and New Testaments to be the inspired word of God, which proclaims the good news of God's salvation through Jesus Christ, acknowledging the authority of God's word? Will you submit to it in all matters of faith? 
Will you faithfully study Holy Scripture and build your life on its foundation and continue to pray for God's people and lead them by your own example in humble service and holy living? Will you accept the church's order and accountability submitting to its discipline should you become delinquent either in life or in doctrine? Will you give your support, encouragement, and energy to the work of this congregation in reaching the lost in our area and to the work of the church abroad in reaching those that have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ? Jason, Eric, as deacons, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully show Christ's love and care Gather and distribute offerings of God's people. Visit and comfort the distressed. Minister to the poor and needy. And strive to advance God's reign of justice and peace. Don, Jr. As elders, will you faithfully, diligently, and cheerfully study God's word. Oversee the household of faith. Encourage spiritual growth. Maintain loving discipline and provide for the proclamation of the gospel and celebration of the sacraments. Don and JR as elders and Jason and Eric as deacons, we call you and ask you to be faithful in performing your duties, to magnify the one who has called you to these high and holy offices, to be zealous for the church of Christ, hospitable, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. Love goodness, holding always to the mystery of the faith. Members of American Reformed, please rise to affirm your covenant with these elders and deacons whom God has given us. Just as we ask them to be faithful in this calling, we as a congregation are asked to be faithful to ours as well. And so, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask, do you receive in the name of the Lord these deacons and elders as duly elected and ordained servants of Christ? If so, respond with, we do. Do you promise to respect them for the sake of the offices for which they have been chosen and ordained? Do you promise to encourage and pray for them to work together in obedience to the gospel for the unity, purity, and peace of the church? In the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved people of God, receive now these deacons and elders as Christ's own servants. Support them in love that their work may bear fruit. In the name and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare these brothers are now duly installed deacons and elders. Thanks be to God. And as we have promised as a congregation to pray for them, I hope that we are praying for them in our individual lives, in our individual prayer time. But we're going to set the example now and pray over them. So I invite you where you're standing, raise a hand as we, through distance, lay our hands and support. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this calling that you have put forth. For elders and deacons, for the, the important office that they play in your church. The role they fill, this calling that has been put forth. We ask your blessing on each of of these individuals as they seek to come in and serve in this season. For we know that you have given us tasks and callings for different seasons of life, and it it is their time. And so we ask your blessing upon them. And thank you for the blessing of all who have served, that all have been willing to take that sacrifice of time and effort for your kingdom. May we continue to be faithful in following you in raising up leaders to support you, and trusting your guidance. For although we put people in the office, it is you who leads us. And for this, we give you thanks. May your Holy Spirit be at work in their lives and each of our leaders and all of us, that we would be in tune with your will and following where you are leading us, O God. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Here in the moment, before we, we have our time in the Word, we're going we're gonna to dismiss our little ones to children's church. Um, but before we do so, let's pray over their time and our time together as well. 
Oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity for Children's Church, for, for our little ones to have a chance to go and learn your truth, to learn uh, what it means to have a relationship with you and grow up in your goodness and love and how that affects how we live our lives, how it gives us peace and comfort in the trials of life, and that we can hold on to hope in what you have done and the promises that you make and that you keep. And so, Lord, I ask your blessing on on our little ones as they go and have their time of study and on our volunteers that are with them helping nurture that growth. And, Lord, as we continue to, to worship you through studying your word, I thank you for the gift of Scripture, for the example that you have given us that we don't have to guess what is true, what is right, what is holy, but we can look to your word and what you have set forth for us that we might know what it means to follow you. And Lord, we do not claim to be perfect interpreters of your word, so we ask for the help of your Holy Spirit. Would would the Spirit illuminate your truth? That way we may see it, we may love what you have put forth and follow faithfully. It is in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. At this time, I dismiss the, the little ones for Children's Church out the back exit. As we start off the new year, we're going to be looking at a couple things that have to do with this idea of turning the page. But I do want to point out as we turn to this morning's message, if you choose to follow along, there are notes in your bulletin this morning. Also, you'll notice there's another sheet called Good Riddance that we will reference later. That is also found in your bulletins. But but it is official Even though we're a week into the new year, 2023 is gone. It is in the past. 2024 is here. And if you're someone who still writes checks, I know not everyone does, it's a hard transition to write a different date. It is a transition into this new year. And what we found is although we we celebrate, or at least some of us celebrate, some of us go to bed early on New Year's Eve, either way, just turning the page on the calendar, it doesn't make everything magically different, does it? You know, if you're, if you're not feeling great, if, if you're suffering through something, that doesn't magically stop just because the number of the year changes. However, what does happen is it, it creates almost a symbolic fresh start. And, and it can be exciting for people and it can also be motivating. Because even if last year was one that had ups and downs and, and maybe had more downs than ups, this new year, it brings a chance to focus on that fresh start. And there's plenty of reasons why this brings excitement for people. For some, celebrating this new year is about leaving the past behind more so than it is about starting something new. For many, 2023 was challenging. We all have our own trials that we face. For some, 2023 was the year that you lost a loved one. And that's hard and and that pain is still there. For others, it was a year of conflict, whether it's with family or friends. Or maybe 2023 was the year that you had hoped that that a lot of those challenges would all kind of fall in line. And it was going to be the year that everything came together, but it didn't work out that way. For whatever reason, last year might not have been your year. And so for some, or maybe many, the best part of turning the calendar, of, of seeing that number 2024 is being able to say goodbye to what is in the past, saying goodbye to 2023. Now, this is not a new feeling. This is a feeling that people have every year, and that's why I think it's so interesting that they have this tradition every year in New York City. So this past Thursday was what they call Good Riddance Day. So what happens every year on December 28th is they take a pepper shredder, much like the one that we have in front of service, probably a little stronger and industrial though, and they set it in the middle of Times Square in New York City. And people are then offered pieces of paper where they can write down things that they want to say good riddance to. Things that they want to leave behind that by writing it down and shredding it, they are symbolically letting go of that thing that had brought them trouble. This is an idea. It has grown in popularity. It's now to the point where if you, people are traveling from outside New York 
just to be a part of this and use their shredder. And if you can't make it there, they even open it up online where you can send in electronically your, your list and someone will write it down or print it off for you and shred it on your behalf. This is really caught on in a way that, that is, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not. But something about this symbolic gesture has resonated with people. And this type of symbolism can be helpful when it allows you to visualize those things that you want to move on from. Maybe not move on in saying that they're no longer around, but move on from having that control in your life. However, we know that these types of actions, while meaningful, don't amount to much if they're not paired with the appropriate actions. For just as New Year's resolutions, such as one to to lose weight, doesn't matter if you're not willing to do diet and exercise. Or if if you have conflict in your life and you say, I want to have no more conflict, but you're not willing to reconcile, you're not willing to forgive the other party. That, That action's not there that's necessary to work towards that resolution. But if you think about it, wouldn't that be a good way to start off the new year? Not just writing down and and shredding those things that we want to symbolically leave behind, but also to start off with forgiveness. I think that's a huge matter of turning that page, of starting fresh, of of feeling a weight lifted off of our back. Now in our, our bulletins this morning, again, we have these sheets. They're called Good Riddance, and we're going to have an opportunity if you want to participate in this today, because New York's kind of a long ways away. So if you want to fill this out sometime during service, after service, and we're going to have a chance for people, if you want to come up and just lay what it is on your list in the shredder, and they'll shred it up, and no one but you and God will know what it is. A chance to symbolically leave those things behind. But if you consider what that is that you want to leave behind, whether it's something that you have control over or something you're giving up to God, just consider that there might be some actions that are necessary as a part of that. That if you want God to work something in your life, there has to be a willingness to prayerfully allow him room to work on your heart to bring you to the place where maybe those things can happen. But as we consider these things, we consider maybe those things that should be left in the past. I would like for us to turn to 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and, and see what Paul teaches us on forgiveness. For if we want to have a reconciled relationship, if we want to leave some of those things in the past and those arguments in the past, we need to be willing to forgive one another. Now, for most, forgiveness is not something that comes naturally. In some ways, we we have to learn what it means to forgive. And even though it doesn't come naturally for everyone, although it doesn't come easy for everyone, it's necessary. It's part of living this life of faith that we are called into. And so if we're in chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we find Paul is is challenging the church in Corinth to forgive a man who was caught in some kind of sin that had caused all kinds of problems and strife amongst their congregation. We're going to pick up here in verse 5. Paul's writing here, he says, Now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put too severely to all of you. Paul is starting off this this section writing about what had happened by using broad terms. He's using words like, if anyone has caused pain. Which is almost an interesting way for him to start here. Because in... Paul, again, he's writing a letter to the Corinthians. When he's talking about someone who who might have caused pain, although we don't know the details, the Corinthians did. He's speaking broadly, but they know exactly who he is talking about. They know exactly what had happened. Paul is not speaking in a, a general sense, or it becomes clear throughout this passage that Paul is speaking about a specific individual, And how this individual's actions caused pain, lingering pain inside the church in Corinth. And then it's later on in chapter 7 of this letter that Paul identifies this person by calling him the one who did wrong. 
I don't know about you, but that's a title I don't want, right? Does anyone here want to be called the one who did wrong? Imagine what it takes to get a title to be known for that. The pain caused to the church in Corinth and the language used to describe this person lends to this idea that this wasn't some minor offense. It wasn't just there was some sin in their life. It was something that was so profound that it hurt the whole church. Whatever it was, obviously this is a big deal we're talking about. Big enough that Paul did not need to name the offense for each of those Corinthians Each of those members of that congregation, they knew what had occurred. Historically, the the church, we're talking about the church throughout the ages, the believers, they believed that the one who did wrong from this passage was the same man from 1 Corinthians, from Paul's first letter to this church, who had developed a romantic relationship with his stepmother. If you want to learn more, go back into 1 Corinthians. But, But what we find then is if that was the case, if he's talking about the same person from his other letter... It would mean that the church in Corinth would have acted upon his direction because Paul had asked them to to bring discipline on that person by removing them for a period of time from the worshiping and body until they could repent and be back in right standing. Of course, over the years, there there have been other ideas developed on, on what this person might have done to earn that title, the one who did wrong. But since Paul never specifically states who this person is or what they did, we are are just left with the evidence in these letters to piece together our best guess. And if you're like me, that's hard. I like knowing the details. I don't necessarily like having things out there that we don't get to know for certain. Especially if it's something important enough for Paul to write about. However, despite our our wanting of that knowledge, there might be a good reason why Paul doesn't name the offense. His purpose in writing this, this section of this letter to the Corinthians is not to recount what happened. That would do nothing for the church. They know what happened. They lived through those events. They are still dealing with the consequences of what occurred. No, he is writing to the Corinthians, not to remind them what happened or to say what happened wasn't good, but he is writing to them so that they might foster forgiveness towards this individual who has caused pain and has most certainly felt pain in this process. For this is what Paul goes on to say in the next two verses. He says, For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. What Paul is describing here in some ways is what we call church discipline. That there was a a matter of helping one realize there's a need to repent, but now they're, they've come to that realization and it's up to the body to welcome them back and help them walk a life of faith. And so that's why Paul comes and he requests the Corinthians that they both forgive and comfort this person. He wants them to minister to this individual amongst their repentance. Now, the exact form of discipline is not given, but we can determine is that this person had repented of this sin during that time. And Paul's request that this offender be shown forgiveness may have actually, if you think about the context of the day, been a little surprising to the recipients of this letter, to those Corinthian believers, because although they were Christians, they were also Romans, that they lived under Romans, Roman rule. And the Roman way of life was not one of forgiveness and encouragement and and comfort. The way the, the Romans ruled was that you completely destroy your enemies. If someone has wronged you, you destroy them. And so Paul's willingness to forgive could have made him look weak in that culture, in that point in time. But sometimes the things that look like weaknesses to the world around us 
are actually the true signs of strength and a mature faith. Which leads us to the first point in our notes this morning. That it, it takes a stronger person to forgive than seek revenge. Now you need to be stronger to forgive than seek revenge. In many ways, seeking revenge comes naturally. It's an easy thing to chase after. Um, I, I saw this a little bit in one of those classic Christmas movies. Uh, I'm sure many of us, if not most, have seen It's a Wonderful Life. I don't know, but I, I saw it again this Christmas. We watched it that week after Christmas. And I have to admit, when it came to the ending, I'll try not to spoil anything, but here, but again, it's a, it, the movie's old enough. If you haven't seen it, spoilers aren't on me, right? But as we get to the end of the movie, and you know, it's, it has its happy ending. But I had, just had this feeling like it's not complete. The movie's over, but I kept thinking, Mr. Potter, the bad guy, nothing bad happens to him. Think about it. The, the hero of the movie goes through and at the end his life is in a better place because of the generosity of all those he had helped throughout the years. But the man who had basically tried to destroy the town, who had stolen to create the bad situation, who had lied to the cops to, again, put a warrant out for an innocent man, all these bad things. And then he's just free at the end. He doesn't go to jail. He doesn't get caught. Nothing. And I have to admit it. it it felt a little unfinished. It's like, you sure there's not an extra minute or two of this movie where they catch the bad guy and everyone celebrates? But there's not. But I think that feeling, that feeling of something more, it lends to this idea that we want revenge. We want to have what we see as justice declared. We want what we see as the guilty party to be punished. Because it's hard to choose forgiveness. But it's easy to choose revenge. And even as forgiveness is extended, even as we show grace, we know that does not erase the past. That forgiving does not mean that the consequences don't exist. For you can forgive someone, but that doesn't mean your relationship with them is going to remain exactly as it was. The trust that was there, that had been built up over the years, it would have to be earned again, if it can. For you can forgive someone for the wrong they have committed against you without leaving yourself open to be taken advantage of. And it can be a difficult lesson to learn, but it's an important one of how do you show someone the love of Christ without becoming their doormat? Because there are people who will take advantage of your kindness of a lot of the opportunity. And I think that's a challenge we all share. That the calling is there to be quick to forgive while at the same point not being taken advantage of in terms of that kindness. But as we learn from Paul's call for the Corinthian church to forgive this individual, the point of the consequences of one's actions, such as the consequences this man faced, is not to punish the offending party, and said the whole point of what happened in 1 Corinthians, if this is the same individual or whatever discipline happened in this person's life, if it's someone else. The point of those actions is to restore that relationship. To restore their relationship with God, which they have severed through their, their rebellion against God. To restore their relationship with their fellow believers. And also to set some guidelines going forward on how to maintain that relationship. And that's exactly what Paul is begging. I don't think he's asking. The way I read this, it's almost like he's begging the Corinthians to do this. Because he says right there, he lays it out for us in verse 8. He says, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Paul here recognizes that he cannot force the Corinthians to forgive this man. It's like that saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. He, can, he knows what they should do, but he can't do it for them. He is doing what he can. He is leaving this matter in their hands. 
Although he does clarify that this is a test of their obedience. Are they willing to do what Christ calls them to do in this matter of forgiveness? For there are two things that he he lays out that he wants the Corinthians to do. He wants them to forgive this individual, but he also wants them to comfort him. To do more than say, I forgive you, but to actually be there and care for him. Now, as you see the next point in your notes this morning, it's actually a quote from C.S. Lewis. He had a lot of theological writings. He's known for the Narnia series. We know him well. But C.S. Lewis says, We all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. That forgiveness sounds great when you're receiving it, but it's harder when you're the one that's got to give it. Because again, forgiveness can be a difficult thing. To not just say you're sorry, because saying you're sorry and then saying, oh, I forgive you, is not the same thing as reconciliation. Those are words. If it's truly reconciled, then it shows in our actions. It's a matter of getting to the point where you are no longer holding anger or hard feelings towards that individual. And what this means is sacrificing in some way the right to retaliate or hold that offense against them. But that's what we are called to do. That we're called to turn the other cheek. To not return evil for evil. In fact, as we see Paul referred to here, we're supposed to do much more than just choose not to retaliate. For when Paul asked the Corinthians to comfort the one who did wrong. He wanted them to help him. To help him not return to that sin that had caused him so much pain. And they wanted him to be encouraged along the way. That way he could walk that path of faith. When someone does something hurtful, there are ways to resolve your differences without becoming angry or confrontational. It might take extra effort, but there are ways to to settle things. You can express your feelings and still work towards what is a helpful outcome for everyone. And while it's tempting to be angry, to be vengeful, to get even, forgiveness is a lot more useful when it comes to mending those strained relationships. As you see Paul continue... In verse 10, we see a little bit of this. He says, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. Paul is still speaking about the same individual, the one who had had done something that caused all this strife in the congregation. He is submitting to the judgment of the Corinthians. He he has expressed what he believes they are called to do, but says, I am submitting this to you. He is making it known that he is not personally holding any grudge against this offender. Notice that Paul says that he forgives, or the forgiveness he has is in the presence of Christ. And that phrase, if you read through all of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, is a theme that is repeated throughout. How our actions are not done in secret, that Jesus knows all that we do. For it's one thing to to say you forgive, but it's another thing to harbor that anger and resentment in your heart. And, And even if you hide it there, God knows it remains. Jesus knows that you are holding on to that unforgiveness. He wants us to be sincere in our forgiveness, to have the right actions, but to do it with the right motives as well. In this scenario, Paul is deferring to the judgment of the Corinthians, although he is undoubtedly, he is nudging them in the right direction. It's almost as if he's saying because the offender here has repented and that he, as Paul, is not holding any hard feelings towards the offender, and we know that God has forgiven this offender, that the church in Corinth should really forgive this individual to take some action so he knows that they don't hold this against him. This is in line with what Jesus taught the disciples from Luke chapter 17. Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. 
And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Now, there's an interesting part of all this as we're talking about forgiveness as a body of believers. That Jesus is clear we're not supposed to become tolerant of sin. He says rebuke when they sin. You know, remind individuals of, of hey, God calls us to this. Instead, again, we make our beliefs known to our fellow Christians. Like, hey, I, I see you're, you're walking away from this path of faith. But we also see in Jesus' words as how as if someone has fallen into the same sin even more than once, as long as they repent, that we need to be welcoming and forgiving. That our desire is that all would come back to that place of faith. That we would choose to let Christ reign mighty in our hearts instead of giving in to the distractions of the devil. Because we know that there are forces out there, that there are temptations, and that there is a spiritual adversary who is trying to draw us away from what Christ has put in our heart and has worked in our life. And Paul alludes to this very directly. He says in verse 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. With these words, Paul is moving past the example of a man who had created a a great sin and puts things into a much broader perspective. There is more at play in what he is teaching than than one person's willingness to forgive another. There is God's direction for his people to be forgiving. And then there are the schemes of the devil trying to stop God's people from living out what Jesus calls us to. Now, we probably don't speak enough of that great enemy of Satan, the devil, loser, whatever you want to call him. But regardless, he exists And we know that he is doing what he can to try to draw us away from God. And when it comes to instances of of hurt feelings or lack of forgiveness, you better bet that he is trying to influence you however he can. As we see in Paul's writing, let us not let Satan win a victory by giving in to our temptations, by holding on to hatred or unforgiveness. For when it comes to forgiveness, there are a couple ways that Satan can win that particular battle. We know the war has already been settled. Christ wins. But it doesn't mean we have to give ourselves to Satan in the process. And so the first of these in your notes is that Satan wants us to neglect church, church discipline. That's one thing we know that he wants. That if we go too far to one extreme, we can move beyond forgiveness into the realm of not holding people accountable for their actions. This is where church discipline and holding each other accountable as believers, it fades away. That if we just ignore what Christ calls us to do and how to live our lives. Now, I know this is a touchy subject for many people and it's hard to talk about holding each other accountable, but it's important. It's important because Jesus talked about it often. And some would rather just everyone mind your own business. And ignore what's happening to the person to your left or to the right. That we'll just leave it up to God to judge sin. And in some ways we do, but, but Jesus commands us to do more than just tolerate the sin in our midst. That we fight against sin. That we encourage one another so that together we could be a people who desire the things of God, not the things of this world. Because at that point... Where we say, you know what, we're just going to say everything goes. When you get to that point, are you any better than a Pharisee? Remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees. He compared them to whitewashed tombs. Because while the Pharisees looked great on the outside, on the inside they were filled with all kinds of filth and immorality. I hope that we all want more for ourselves than that. So it is important that we don't forgive our, or don't, we don't give ourselves over to sin. Everyone sins and we cannot escape that fact. But we are never just to accept the sin in our life. That we continue to repent. That we continue to, to seek God. 
For if you give yourself over to sin and, and give the victory to this rebellion against God, you're doing exactly what the devil wants. But as you see in the last point of your notes this morning, that likewise Satan also wants you to be unforgiving towards those who have had a change of heart. This is the other extreme. This brings us back to the point of of being there and supporting and encouraging one another. The point of what we call discipline, of, of mentioning these things, it's about bringing about reconciliation. We don't want to be tolerant of sin, but once that repentance has happened, we don't hold that against one anymore. It is gone. We should be helpful to that person, given opportunities for, for help and encouragement and growth beyond those things. If we as the people of God truly care for one another, care in the way that Jesus cares for us, then we must be willing to forgive and to nurture and support and care. Not say you care, but genuinely care about one another. Especially when someone stumbles. It's easy to say you care when when someone is good to you, when someone has been a good friend and they haven't done anything that makes you upsetting. But are you willing to be there and care and support when someone does something that makes you upset? Because that's where that faithfulness is tested. Are you willing to, feel, to follow Jesus even when, when you still have some of that negative feeling towards what this person had done? Are you willing to let that go for the sake of the gospel? And so as we start off 2024, make sure that you haven't left any unforgiveness to carry over from 2023. Be willing to forgive and move beyond those hurts of the past. Be free of that. And as for everything else that is best left behind, say good riddance. Fill out that sheet in your bulletin. Leave it up to God. And then at the end of service, we'll have an opportunity to walk up front and to drop it in the shredder, give it to God and leave it behind before we leave and shake hands. But as we consider those things, what it is that God is calling us to move past, what God is calling us to keep, where forgiveness needs to be granted, let us turn and pray to our Lord and Savior. Oh Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these symbolic new starts, for a chance to to have self-reflection and understand where exactly we are in our walk of faith and what are we holding on to that we shouldn't and what are the things that, that we are called into that we have not pursued. Lord, use this chance. Work in our hearts. Help us to be receptive to you. And as we come together as your people praising your name, we thank you for, for our leaders that are called in the service and we ask that as consistory meets not this week but next week and they start talking through our, our plans of ministry for this upcoming year and, and how we can be faithful to you, that you be working in their hearts already, preparing those that are serving in different offices, be working with the ministries that are planning ahead, the planning for this mission trip coming up this summer. May, may those details and, and matters of planning fall into place in a way that we can see your handiwork. Thank you, Lord, for all who step up and answer the call to faithfulness in your service through a variety of ways. We recognize, Lord, that although you are God full of grace and peace and forgiveness, that we live in a violent world, a fallen world. And we ask that you would bring peace. That's hard to hear some of the atrocities that are happening to to our fellow man in different parts of the planet, whether it's in the Middle East or in Ukraine or, or in other parts of the world that don't get publicized on the news, but people are still suffering nonetheless. Lord, grant your people strength. We also think of the people of of Perry, Iowa, with the shooting that has occurred. And I ask that you bring comfort in the midst of a situation that offers anything but comfort. And now that we have tasted our first bit of winter for this calendar year, please grant safe travel, both on our way home, but through the day tomorrow as we're supposed to get snow. Help us to adjust our driving to what this season demands of us. We also, O Lord, lift up to you those 
who we recognize as needing prayer over a variety of health concerns, oh Lord. We think of Roxanne with this recent scan and these unidentified specs and ask that you would help that not to be something of concern as they are monitored. And we think of Kelly with this, this diagnosis of esophageal cancer and ask for your help in discernment of those treatment options. Continue to be with Zach as he, he works through his physical therapy. Grant him small successes. That way he might continue to be encouraged on the path ahead. We also grant strength to those who are fighting cancer. We think of Jaime and Pastor Irwin and Randy and Scott and others. Grant them strength. Grant them encouragement when they need it and help those around them know how they can be of support to them during this battle. We also raise up to you those who are going through different challenges in life that not all of our our concerns, not all of our hurts or pains are on display for the world to see, but they're still there and you know what they are. Whether they're things that we're writing on these sheets and and giving up to you through the destruction and shredding of these sheets or if it's other things that are there that maybe we haven't admitted ourselves. Help us to trust you enough to come to you in prayer, come to you in that private time and offer these things to you allow you to work in our lives and trust you to fix these things that we know we cannot handle ourselves. And Lord, we, we ask you to be with those who are unable to be with us on a regular basis, those who would love to be able to come and worship with us, but because of health or other reasons are, are found at a distance. May you work in their lives. Would you offer them these same blessings and would you help them feel united this body as we join together in this time as your people? And we pray the prayer that you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite, if you're willing and able, please rise as we sing together number 382, Be Thou My Vision.
reminder that we have our opportunity following service if you do want to leave something behind. But as we prepare to go, prepare to serve our Lord in how we live our lives, carry with you yourselves this blessing from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. That may Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Yeah.